Good evening and welcome to Town Meeting Television's continuing coverage of Town Meeting 2022. And today we're gonna to do a deep dive into one of the ballot questions facing the Burlington City of Voters, City Voters. Today, I think is the 11th of February. Sometimes it's hard to keep track. And many people in Burlington may have received their ballots and are wondering how to vote on the ballot questions of which there are five. And we're gonna look at number four, which is the pledging the credit of the city to secure the indebtedness for public improvements within the downtown TIF district. And this will focus on the Main Street area. And today we have with us, Brian Pine, who is the director of CEDO, Community and Economic Development Office, who will be telling us about the financing aspect of this project. And Laura Wheelock, who is a senior engineer at the Department of Public Works, will be talking about the project that is being contemplated to be funded with the TIF, TIF funds. So welcome both of you, thanks for joining us. I'll just remind folks that they can call us if they have questions at 862-3966. We'd love to hear from you. We have time for a few um, once we go through the presentation. So Brian, why don't you um, help us unpack that ballot question number four that the Burlington voters will be voting on. Sure. Thanks for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. Um, tax increment financing is a rather arcane municipal finance topic that uh, it may put folks uh, to sleep, but we'll try and get through this and give folks at least an idea of what it is we're asking on the ballot. Um, the, the, the question is essentially asking if the voters will pledge the city's um, full faith and credit toward the repayment of a bond, which will be issued, in other words, sent, sold to investors, investors who invest in the bond provide the city with the cash, the city uses those funds to pay for the cost of the rebuilding of Main Street all the way from Union Street down to Battery Street. So that's like in a nutshell what this is. However, what is unique about tax increment financing is rather than raising taxes to pay the, to pay the bond back, which is done annually or over, over a period of years, um, the uh, tax increment financing is a state, state program that allows the municipality to define a district, an area of the city in which uh, the revenue comes from the growth in property values. So not by raising taxes, but by seeing values grow and that growth is captured to pay back the bond. So, however, in, it, in, in the state policy says, in the event that that growth never occurs and there's not sufficient growth, we call that increment, so you have nothing to capture, you need to go to the voters and explain to them that this has happened, and then they will have to, you'll have to dip into your municipal tax revenue. So this is sort of a fail safe or a backstop or like a guardrail to keep us from defaulting on the bond. That's essentially what this is. But I would say that TIF in Burlington has been operational since 1996. All the work on the waterfront was financed with TIF, tax increment financing, and a, a number of projects in our downtown, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And we've never missed a payment and a single payment in the eight TIF districts in Vermont has ever been missed. And so that, that authorization that's on the ballot is required and is critical, but we have never needed to go back to the taxpayer to cover that debt service, that payment. So mortgage payment, think of it like as uh, on a monthly basis. And what would be the, the basis for increasing the value, the differential incremental value that the city can recover to pay back the TIF? What's an example? Yeah. Of example, that? yeah, I'm example is that in 19, in 20, I'm sorry, 2011, when this district was created, um, the taxable value of all the properties in the district was 170 million. So that's the baseline. Nothing changes with that revenue. So that, that property value generates revenue that covers the schools at about 65, 68 cents of every dollar. And the balance goes to fund police and fire and streets and all the you know, library and parks and rec and all the other city services. Those, those funds continue to flow to the taxing authorities of the schools and the city. And it's the difference, the growth in value. So as property values go up within that district, that's what's recaptured for the purpose of paying back the bond. So I'm gonna get a little detailed here because I think it's important not to gloss over this. 75% of the incremental growth 
um, is that is intended for the schools uh, is captured for TIF repayment. The other 25% goes to the state of Vermont to the education fund. 100% of the portion of taxes that goes to the city flows to re repay the TIF debt. Um, after the original taxable value is um, is is covered, so I, I I think it's it's important for folks to know that we're all the original taxes that flow from the properties in the district continue to flow to the taxing authorities of the schools and the city, and it's the increment, the growth in value. So growth in value would be a great example would be when you take a property. Um, that is a surface parking lot and instead you put a building on that parking on that parking lot so as a parking lot it has a very low value because that's a that's what's called a not the highest and best use so in urban terms you want to build up your downtown to support your tax base so you don't have to continually go back to the to the homeowners and raise their taxes but instead you're driving values in the downtown to cover the cost of municipal services so the goal here is to is to use this financing and I'll say as an aside, or perhaps I think it's an important point, if we had sufficient revenue to pay for these costs, these infrastructure costs, we wouldn't be going through the complicated um, system or gyrations of having to use tax increment financing. We'd be using other revenue sources, but really as a city, we have very few options for how to fund big infrastructure projects like this. And so that's why Burlington and, and seven other municipalities in Vermont have decided that in their downtowns to promote a healthy, vibrant, economically thriving downtown, these improvements are needed but rather than ask today's taxpayer to pay for it through their taxes, we wanna capture this growth in value in the district. So example would also be, for instance, the cathedral church, uh, which is no longer functioning as a church. When that goes on the tax rolls, that generates new value that wasn't there before. That is all increment. That's 100% increment because that's a tax exempt property. So that's actually a really stark example of seeing growth in the tax uh, taxable values in the district. So of that 150 million that was Evaluated, evaluated. Yeah, 170. Yeah. 170 in 2011. What, yeah. What's that number now? Do you Today know? it's two, 285 is the value of that district. So the values have gone up quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. So we can so, capture that increment, that growth to fund and pay back the, the bond. Yeah. Thank you so much. So why don't we go to Laura and have her tell us a little bit about what the voters would be in, what we would be investing in and what the voters are being asked to um, secure in effect. Yep, thank you. Um, so the project that we put in front of the state of Vermont is Main Street, as Brian described, from Battery Street to South Union. It is a complete streetscape reconstruction as well as revitalization of our underground utilities. Uh, which would include the 130 year old water main and uh, the sewer that's in there, as well as the services that go to different properties. Um, provide opportunities for public amenities, public seating, pause places, street lighting, um, and really importantly, management of stormwater and being able to kind of regrow our street ecology with the street trees and providing them infrastructure to, to grow and thrive in a hardscaped downtown. So are you, I'm not able to see the slides. Are you showing slides? No, I haven't started that yet. Okay, so. all right. It would be great to see some pictures. Um, and I imagine, I mean, one of the things we were talking about before is that people are concerned that um, the construction will be hard for businesses to handle. And I just wonder, how disruptive is this kind of construction, especially, you know, underground utilities, water mains and things like that? Yep. Um, as we skip through a whole bunch of things, we do have images to talk about the, the TIF districts that Brian mentioned um, and some of the facts that we can go back to and a little bit of a graphic to help describe TIF if questions go in that direction. Um, and of course, and just to say, people can go to the city's website and see this presentation also. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yep, it's available in a few locations in different forms. Um, but the fundamentals of a great street is working to rebalance our right-of-ways for the uses of today and tomorrow. Uh, Main Street hasn't had a significant construction project in decades uh, to the point that there's not really a living memory inside the city the last time that the that Main Street has been reconstructed. Um, 
the purposes that we or the rebalancing that we will use on Main Street. Sorry, my husband's trying to double feed my dogs. Um, <laughs> is uh, we'd rebalance it for dedicated clear pedestrian spaces, provide better opportunities for transit, uh, still keeping the existing vehicle uses and available parking on both sides of every block, but also providing um, a dedicated separated space for bicycles. There would be opportunities for new public amenities within these spaces, uh, creating new spaces for, for public gatherings, for other activations of side businesses, really based on what the community needs are. And we have started our outreach process for Great Streets and, it's, and the work that was done to date, which you're seeing on the screen was back in 2016 and, and the city did pause um, to construct our other Great Street, St. Paul Street. We worked on City Hall Park, which was also um, a lot coordinated with this effort and are now restarting Main Street. The fact that you haven't heard about it for a few years is okay. We are working to gather people, build up momentum. You know, we had 20 people in our first public meeting and since then I've already met with three times that many. Um, and, and there's still a lot more outreach to go. And as we go, we're gonna collect people so that we can keep people informed and grab their voices to understand what these other spaces can be. So when you say pe people, who are those people? Yep, um, so we started with a community level neighborhood meeting, reaching out to, uh, with mailers to a, a six by four block of the downtown circled around Main Street. We've reached out to businesses both uh, along the Main Street and the downtown corridor. We've met with waterfront business owners. We have met, um, starting going through some of the NPAs so far. And just recently this week, uh, we met with a youth group through the Burlington Downtown High School. Um, and by far those, those those youth leaders have provided more new ideas to this opportunity on Main Street than I've heard in the entire time. Um, we have other outreach plans looking for BIPOC groups, seniors, differently abled, um, as well as an organization that um, helps with refugee and immigrants and that outreach can't happen until April based on their availability, but it's still within the window of time that we're looking to collect feedback. So you're talking to people who would be users of the street and businesses who people who own businesses on the street. We are so. we are looking for for that. Um, we're looking for any Burlingtonian. This is Main Street. This is your community street. Um, your voice, whether you live on the super far end of North Ave or, you know, the extreme end of of Queen City Park Road. This is Main Street. This is Burlingtonians Street. So. We want the ideas, we wanna understand what brings people to this street and what will continue to bring people. Um, and how long would this project take? Mm -hmm. Nope, uh, you're hitting on all of our slides, but we can we can stay here so people can see the image. Um, yeah. the, the, we're looking for a pretty aggressive pace on our design schedule. So uh, we would work through the concept phase from now and through about May, um, transition into more of a hard functional design uh, engineering side and then look to start construction in the fall of 2023. So a year and a half or so from now to start work on the six blocks. Construction work is gonna take a minimum of two years. Um, there is another component of the project. I just wanna skip ahead two slides. That is the ravine sewer. That's an approved project. Um, this one's a little bit more of an unknown and really could, could change the schedule of the uh, South Union Winooski end of the project potentially. Can you go back a slide so we can see some of the changes that you're thinking about? Yep. Yep, so this highlights Main Street's existing conditions. You know, as we mentioned that it really hasn't been touched in a really long time. Um, there's a lot of deficiencies. You know, Main Street has some of our widest tree belts and the trees are not thriving in this existing condition. There are different looks and feels of each block, but some of them are really unactivated and only dedicated to two uses. There are some significantly deteriorating surfaces. There are a lot of accessibility challenges interfacing between the public way and the private uh, storefronts and, and doorways that exist on Main Street. 
And there are challenges with our underground utilities that are, are coming to fruition, whether we do this project or not. And there's a 130 year old 16 inch water main that goes up Main Street. That's a really old water main. No, there's no living person alive that would have ever seen that construct. And that's scary. It, it transmits water up to the reservoir. And we know, um, you know, we've seen that fail actually in our lifetime on Main Street, big emergency dealing with the water main breaking. The water main, not, not as much actually, that's the sewer. Some of those really oh. large excavations up uh, near the Gateway Block and Memorial, that's been the sewer. That's oh, okay. in the ground. Okay. Also still scary and on the agenda. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, um, what kind of um, what kind of opposition have you been getting to to this? Like, what I guess the better question is, what concerns ha do people have about the project, and why um, would the people not want to support this? I would say we we presented to every NPA, and there's been a few people asking questions about the impact on on taxpayers, and I think the important piece to you know we. We are, we are as city officials here to provide information and not advocate a vote one way or the other. But a real important fact is that TIF is the only tool, the only financing tool to pay for this, this type of infrastructure without raising taxes that we know of. There's no grant funding. People think, oh, just go get some federal grants. There's no grants for this type of project. This is a, this is a local locally funded project. And so the only tool that we have available in our toolbox to really do this type of substantial, um, complete rebuild of, of our main street, six blocks of that street, is this funding source. So this is why TIF is so um, so timely right now. It's also that our deadline to do this, incur this debt, is next year by the end of March. So we're looking at a pretty short timeline to kind of before our before our TIF district closes in terms of taking on new borrowing for new projects. So that's an important piece. Yeah. It, I think is, if I can add on, is it's also helpful to separate, voters are being asked to vote on the funding source and not the concept. The concept is just starting to take input to, to reshape the vision that's being shared on the screen right here. This was the 2016 proposal that we did take feedback on and we're, t we're collecting that now. And it's really the voices that we hear from now until May that will reshape this image into what the community wants. But we need to have funding to continue forward. And that's, that's all that that request is. Allow us to continue to develop the vision of the community to what Main Street can be. So I think that you make a very important point and people also vote on financial questions based on their bro broader concerns. So for example, I can imagine somebody thinking, well, what happens to, you know, what impact does this massive construction have on the businesses, you know, over a two year period? And, and what could the city do to mitigate those effects, right? Yeah, yeah yep. absolutely. Laura, Laura has some stuff. We can't say we're going to do it all, but why don't you list some examples of ways that we're going to try to mitigate the impacts, at least what we're looking at. Yeah, so, so we've, we've uh, already taken a lead from, you know, some of the recent large streetscape reconstructions that have happened in like Waterbury and Barrie, and, and they are challenging to get through. And um, one of the biggest things the businesses have been asking us is just to ensure that there's really significant communication, that they have an, a good understanding about how pedestrians are gonna get to their store. We're a clientele that needs kind of a quick pick up and drop off or a shorter distance to get um, to their storefront depending on the service that's being provided. So the outreach is a really huge component and it's, it's one of the lessons learned from St. Paul Street. Um, Signage is another really large component so that people can find where they're going. Um, the other opportunities, you know, we've heard some other communities like Middlebury who, who were successful in a, being awarded a grant to help with business advertisement, marketing, uh, still encouraging people to come to their downtown. And these are all strategies as well as, you know, some other more creative ones that we need to vet um, that we're working on so that, you know, this can be the easiest, you know, reconstruction of this street. But like the other images showed, something's going to have to happen, whether we pick out, pick away at it over 20 years, or, you know, we do it in a, a shorter window of time and come out with a, a greater street in the end. 
And Laura, you said you heard some really innovative ideas from young young people that you work with. Does any any of those ideas stand out for you? Um, I loved that one of the youth members asked about, you know, can we put a, a basketball court or or some sort of other, you know, more recreational orientated infrastructure in or nearby with this project? Um, you know, and, and it caught me a little off guard thinking that there are some parks that are pretty nearby, but there's none that really had strong recreational facilities. Um, they also talked a lot about wanting pause places, um, both for themselves, but they thought even bigger outside the box into the entire community. Mentioning that families would need a place to pause, that other differently abled people would really enjoy a place to pause. Um, they talked about the ecology on the street, recognizing that the trees aren't there just for our stormwater, which, you know, from DPW, I think about that, but the shade, the shade to allow people to pause. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, they hit on really finding a way for, for our younger, even younger than them community to interact with the street and find it fun. Um, the statement came out that families will really make the street feel inviting and there needs to be a way for families to exist on the street. Well, and it looks like there'll market. be some less, it looks like you're planning potentially less street and more sidewalk area, which does provide for a safer interaction. Um, maybe I'm thinking whizzing bicycles, but I can imagine it's it, the idea is to make it a safer um, thoroughfare for pedestrians and humans. And yeah. Um, and also easier for cars to navigate by changing the parking and some of the transitions that uh, that are evident in this image. Yeah. yeah, we should also probably just mention that in 2016, the voters approved, or was it 2015, Laura? 2015. 2015, voters approved a $10 million um, TIF bond for a variety of downtown projects. I just want to go over what we have spent the money on to date. I think it's a slide perhaps before this. It is. Uh, the other direction more. maybe. Yeah. Um, what we've done with that money already, just to say, here's where your money has gone. It's um, we spent just over 5 million on these projects here. So the complete rebuild of St. Paul from Maine to Maple. Um, uh, along the Great Street's design, um, major repairs to the Marketplace Garage to save sort of that piece of downtown infrastructure. Uh, brownfield is the term for contaminated sites and the, the city-owned parking lot um, that is now uh, student housing for Champlain students was remediated. So it was cleaned up using um, uh, TIF funds in order for that development to go forward and the um, stormwater upgrades that were associated with City Hall Park when City Hall Park was redone have all been done with existing downtown um, TIF. There's also, Laura, there's a slide that shows sort of the six blocks and that we already have voter approval for, for two of the six blocks. Um, um, I think it's going that way. Yeah, I think it's, there it is right there. So if you look at that line, that big thick, that's Main Street that is sort of pink or orange uh, coral colored there. Um, in the middle of it is the darkened area. That's the part that voters have already approved. Um, the, the approval that we have um, from the state of Vermont runs the entire six blocks. And that's the Vermont Economic Progress Council, which reviews municipalities and they oversee our TIF program, if you will. And they've said yes to that, but you need to get your voter approval. And that's what we're facing. That's what we're bringing to the voters in this um, ballot. So just to recap, I think it's important. We've been talking about ballot question number four before the Burlington City voters, which is a really a question to approve TIF financing um, for a project that contemplates the upgrade of Main Street from Battery Street to Union. So uh, just to clarify, as Laura Wheelock, Senior Engineer at Department of Public Works has said, the vote is on the financing question and the design work and the community input and feedback is happening now and the design work will happen following the approval of this, of this uh, ballot question. So I wanna thank you both, Brian Pine, Director of CETO and Laura Wheelock, Senior Engineer at Department of Public Works. Thank you for bringing up that slide. If you have more questions on this ballot item or any of the town meeting 2022 ballot questions, please go to burlingtonvt.gov. And of course, stay tuned here to Town Meeting Television, self-named, 
to celebrate democracy and local democracy in all of its forms. So thank you for watching and thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks for having yeah. us. Bye-bye.
welcome back to Town Meeting Television's continuing coverage of Town Meeting 2022. Today, we are with two citizen advocates, walk safety advocate, Tony Reddington, and advocate Michael Wong, who are interested in talking about um, ballot question number four before the Burlington city voters. And the ballot question number four pledges the credit of the city to secure indebtedness for public improvements within the downtown TIF district. And that would be, this question has to do with financing improvements on Main Street, which is part of the TIF district in Burlington between Union and Battery Street. We've heard from city officials about what that proposal is. And Tony and Michael have some comments and questions that they are raising concerning that. We wanted to hear from them. So why don't we start with you, Tony, and you can tell us, um, your view of ballot question number four before the Burlington voters. You're muted, so let's get you. Unmuted. Actually, I was gonna go first, Lauren, if Okay, I could. great. All right, so Michael. Switch, Michael. Thanks, Tony. Awesome. Okay, I'm, I'm Michael Long, and I'm here to talk about a TIF. I have a little bit of a different perspective than, than Brian does. I've, in fact, I've had kind of a revelation about TIF over the years as, um, as Brian noted, the first TIF district was established on the waterfront back in 96. And I was supportive of TIF in those days because TIF uh, seemed kind of like a magical financing tool. that We could borrow a lot of money and make a lot of great improvements on the waterfront, which we all enjoy, uh, have enjoyed for many years now. Uh, and it wouldn't raise our taxes. Uh, it was kind of a, a win-win, borrow money, don't have any more taxes to pay, and everything is great, it's kind of like free money. And then over the years, I started to wonder about that. And I discovered that there's a lot more to it than, uh, than free money, and that that claim that your taxes don't go up is not really, accurate. So from my perspective now, TIF is a public financing tool, but not a really good or an honest one. When somebody's, when, when we when we see something that seems too good to be true, often we find out later that um, it is too good to be true. And that's been my experience um, with, with TIF. TIF does damage even when it funds worthy pro projects. Uh, it, it can fund great things, but it's not the right way to fund them. And uh, there are there are other ways. Brian suggests that it's kind of our only alternative, but I think just a straightforward: if you want something, you bond for it, and then you and then you pay for it. That's the right way to do it because TIF hijacks a tax revenue stream intended to support schools and city services and uses those dedicated dollars for other purposes. And whether they're worthy or not, that's not the point. The point is schools and city services are suffering. We should support and fund worthy projects, but not use TIF because it strips revenue away from those other uh, things that we need uh, and, and continue to need. So the basic, the, there are two false claims that, uh, TIF rests on. The first one is that your taxes won't go up. And the second one is that TIF debt is paid back by tax increments. That is new taxes that didn't exist before. And so we didn't have them before. Uh, thus, we're not really losing anything when we take that stuff we didn't have before and use it to uh, fund uh, TIF projects. Well, taxes must go up because TIF debt is paid back with tax dollars. More tax dollars are needed if we have TIF debt than if we don't have TIF debt. That's a tax increase. In fact, it's, it's somewhat ironic that on the ballot uh, for town meeting day this year, we have a tax increase of five and a half percent that we're being asked to fund and also TIF. Well, if we weren't all already paying back TIF debt, we'd have more money to fund city services and we wouldn't need as much of a tax increase or maybe any, any, any at all. Uh, the, 
the so-called increment is also um, it's 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 a it's a deeper issue than to say oh it's an increment and now we're going to use that increment because the increment goes far beyond new taxes from new development. The way that it works is that every year after you establish the baseline year, the original taxable value, and Brian alluded to that earlier, uh, once you establish the base tax value, every year after that, any increase goes becomes part of the increment. Um, and for instance, I have a house uh, that I've lived in since 1983. And uh, back in 2011, my taxes were about $6,000. Now in 2022, they're about $12,000. If my house were in a TIF district, half of those tax dollars, $6,000, would be going to the increment. It's not because I developed it or, or, or put an addition on or anything like that. Just taxes go up. So every property in the TIF district and the downtown area and the waterfront area are places where there's a lot of valuable real estate. Every dollar that goes up on any property there becomes part of TIF. And that robs schools and city services of revenue that they would have otherwise. They're, they're having to exist on revenue from 2011, but it's 2022 and lots of things have uh, gone up. The YMCA is another example. And, and, and Brian alluded to the cathedral, which is a property that may be coming into private ownership. So the YMCA was a tax exempt property in 2011. So it had a zero value on the tax rolls. Now it's worth more than $3 million and it pays over $80,000 in taxes, but all of those $80,000 go to TIF. That's great if you wanna fund TIF projects. I mean, it seems like something you wanna celebrate, but those are dollars that could be going into schools and municipal services and it would make it easier to fund those things and, uh, and, and those tax rates could go down as a result if we had the windfall of the 80,000 from a ex exempt property going into uh, the tax rolls suddenly. So uh, the, the, the result is that TIF bleeds more and more dedicated tax dollars from schools and essential city services with each passing year. As expenses increase over time, and as new development makes greater demands on schools, more, more students to educate in new housing that's built and so forth, uh, ever larger and larger sums and a greater proportion of those sums from the tax base gets diverted to TIF. So from my perspective, it's a horrible public policy uh, it creates a huge revenue stream uh, for that politicians like to have, but to the detriment of schools and city services. And uh, it, it, it's this is a view that we see in uh, from the joint um, joint office of the the fiscal um, office that studies for the legislature legislature. And I do a screen to share. But oh, I just want to say one thing. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so I just wanted to make sure Tony had some time. Okay, let me let me move move on to Tony then, and I'll, I won't uh, go on to that screen. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Michael. You're welcome. Tony Reddington. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, I'm going to put on my uh, little slideshow here. Um, my name, again, is Tony Reddington. I live on uh, in Ward 3, uh, very near... Uh, on, on St. Paul Street, very near uh, the uh, high crash location at uh, uh, Maine and St. Paul, uh, where we've had a fatal crash in the past. And I, and I, re I responded uh, very immediately when, when this uh, ballot item came up and a short presentation was given at our neighborhood planning assembly two, three last month. Uh, I'm, on, I'm on the steering committee there and have been for, for a better, for about a decade. And I, I basically feel we should vote no on item four. 
Um, we, it amounts to a $32 million blank check to make changes on seven blocks on Main Street uh, from North, South Union at the uh, adjacent to the Edmund School to Battery Street. And four of those seven intersections are on the Vermont High Crash List. But you wouldn't know it if you were involved in the public uh, discussions over the last several years. In fact, as a practical matter, um, just spread this up here. As a practical matter, there has been no public discussion. The public involvement ended in 2016, seven years ago, and uh, or six, year, six years ago. Uh, I happened to be at one of those meetings and uh, um, I pointed out to then uh, a, a planner, uh, Macon Tuttle, who's now director of planning, that in the Great Streets presentation, after I seen the whole slideshow, there was no mention of safety. And her reaction was, oh, gee, I guess we forgot that. Well, I think they did, uh, but they forgot a lot more than just safety. Uh, there never was an advisory committee. Uh, our uh, NPAs had uh, appointed people to, uh, like for Brian's uh, uh, community development program, we've appointed people to the North Avenue Corridor Study, the Winooski Corridor Study, the Rail Enterprise Project uh, participated in that, um, the Colchester Avenue uh, studies and so forth. Uh, but there was never any advisory committee on, the, on, on, uh, on, on Main Street. And yet, it's, it's the, it, yet our NPA has uh, borders uh, four of the seven, excuse me, five of the seven uh, intersections between uh, South Union and, and, uh, and the uh, Union Station. So there never was involvement of, really of anybody. Uh, and by the way, uh, uh, NPA 1-8 and NPA 6 and even NPA 5, that's a block away, all have direct connections and concerns about the street, not just NPA 2-3, which is downtown and Old North End. Safety was never a, a public works priority. That's a real concern. Uh, we've had, uh, we got four high crash intersections, including the one at, uh, at, at, at uh, South, at, at South Winooski in Maine is the number one highest crash locations in the state of Vermont. Yet you didn't hear a, a mention of a word of any safety issue or, or crash problem on any of these intersections in the, our presentation uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, from the public works and the, uh, and, and the consultants. Climate change. A whole hour presentation of, of by uh, public works and the consultants. The words public, the words climate change never came up. But we have a city council that said that climate change is a, a public a, a public health crisis. Equity, fairness to the King Maple neighborhood that that, board, that, that that's at the border of two of the high crash locations. Uh, we have a public works. Uh, excuse me, we have a policy of the city council that says. Racism is a public health emergency. Any discussion of equity by the by the proponents of this, this uh, really well not even thought out process. No, public wants public works basically wants a blank check, and without a vague, without even a vague plan and a record of never addressing issue at a single one of the twenty high crash locations on the state list. Let's go a little further. Um, I just want to mention that we have five downtown roundabouts in Vermont. Um, the high crash. It, uh, the high crash intersections, all 20 in Burlington, average 1.4 injuries a year. Real safety problem. The five downtown roundabouts in Vermont, in Manchester Center, Montpelier, and Middlebury, they average one injury a decade. This is the one at, uh, in the middle of uh, uh, Manchester Center. Um, how about a gondola ride? I was talking, uh, there's been discussions of two alternatives for serving transportation up through uh, from the waterfront to UVM. One of them is a gondola ride from Union Station right at the end of Main Street, straight up UVM to Davis Center with a possible stop at the marketplace. Why wasn't this looked at? Why isn't it studied? Where is the leadership in our city? Nice picture, but we'd all be looking down at the marketplace from this vantage point. Um, on the North Winooski, on this Winooski's plan, uh, this, this shows uh, that in the Winooski Corridor Study, they did look at the first, the highest crash location uh, intersection in the state of Vermont. They looked at the uh, gateway intersection to our downtown, the uh, South Winooski and Main Street. And they, they came up with a, a, a roundabout that easily fits within there. And in fact, actually, I think it's a little, a little too large. It should be made smaller. Uh, how about light rail? Uh, the city looked at uh, uh, light rail, uh, uh, rail study in 1990s, and it chose two two basic routes as a priority uh, through the, from the waterfront, through the, through the uh, marketplace 
and up to either up either Main Street or College Street to the UVM and eventually on to University Mall. Why aren't we looking at this? For the $32 million we're talking about here, if it was worthwhile, we could fund more than the city's share of either one of these projects, a gondola or a light rail project. There's a, a light rail car, which by the way, you walk onto and can have a corral for bicyclists. Um, going on to the cost. The high crash intersections, including the one right here at Maine and um, St. Paul Street. Uh, Cape Warneman was killed in a T-bone crash there, uh, a worker at, uh, in her 30s from dealer.com. We are talking about serious injuries and serious costs in regard to all these high crash, uh, these high crash locations. The second line here is the number of intersections, four high crash intersections on Main Street, 78 injuries per 10 years, two per year per intersection, and $15 million per decade in, in, in injury and uh, suffering and economic costs. So um, let's say this uh, in, in terms of the highest crash intersection, uh, that averages at, at, uh, South, South, at Main Street and South Winooski, that, that averages 7.5 injuries per year. Um, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and during it, basically economic costs come down to $400,000 a year. Compare that again, to the four downtown roundabouts in Vermont, where you have one injury a decade. There's no comparison. The Public Works Department knows these numbers. It refuses to deal with safety as a priority. Our city plan, 2011, says investments in transportation, uh, in transportation investments, safety is quote unquote critical. It's not and has not been as a matter of policy. It's got to change because we, we both in the United States with 21,000 excess deaths and Vermont uh, who contributed two deaths to the 15% increase in PED deaths in the last, uh, last uh, decade, we must change. And I think that we, the first place the stage to, to make this change is to require that there be prior planning, that we, that we uh, vet all of the intersections and that we make safety the biggest key item on any rebuilding of Main Street. Um, so thank you. I just, I just have to clarify one thing, which is the reason that that unfortunate woman was T-boned was because of a drunk driver, not because of the failure of the intersection. Isn't that true? No, that's, that's actually not true. Uh, the, if had there been a roundabout at that intersection, the car that it hit her, but I don't know if the person was, was uh, actually uh, uh, drunk, but I do know that he was being chased by the police which yeah. brings up another question. Why was he being chased by the police? Uh, but the point is, no, uh, the, the, uh, you bring up a good point, Lauren, Glenn, and that is that we must begin to recognize that speed is what kills on our town, or on our city highways. Uh, we have, uh, Chapin Spencer says all the time, oh, we have all these 25 mile an hour streets. We're gonna add more 25 mile an hour streets. The 20 intersections that are high crash in Burlington are mostly 25 mile an hour streets, but they don't have the physical characteristics to slow traffic down to not 25, which in most cases in our downtown areas, Old North End, South End, and so forth. We really want the speeds down to 20 miles an hour. That's the new goal and the new paradigm that was announced by US Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, just last month. So no, uh, the, 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 I'm, I'm right now, and able to walk just about everywhere without going through a intersection uh, from where I'm living uh, into the uh, various places along Church Street. I didn't realize until I moved here down to this particular location, what a blessing it is not to have to deal with a single pushing of a button, waiting for cars to clear, looking for cars as I'm going across, worried about being somebody blowing a red light or something. So no, we, we need to start replacing the, as most uh, modern, uh, communities and even in the United States and uh, countries that are way ahead of us in safety start retiring our, our traffic signals. But most importantly, in this case, we haven't even we haven't even bothered to look at these intersections to look at safety. So, um, and also just to clarify, and then uh, Michael, if you have a closing comment, but just to clarify, so this ballot question number four is a question about TIF financing. Um, it's it's primarily a financing question. And you, Michael, have talked about the fact that you think that TIF misrepresents its financial benefits in that the, the incremental the difference between the 170 million that um, this TIF district was valued at in 2011 
and the 285 million that it is valued at now diverts money um, to these improvements that could be diverted or, or funneled to school and other city services. Is that correct? That, that, that is correct. And, and, and I think what, what is misrepresented often in promoting TIF as a viable and responsible tool is that the notion that those new, that increment is all brand new money and therefore uh, those other services aren't, aren't being compromised in any way. But they, okay. they really are being seriously compromised. In California, they did away with TIF because of what it was doing to schools. And, uh, and in lots of places, it's a, a very controversial and has kind of a checkered, uh, checkered history. So uh, I just really realized recently that uh, the, the way that every dollar of increment uh, goes, goes to TIF. So what you can see is, again, you're... you're you're, you're dealing with 2000, $2,011 to fund those things. And in the case of education, it's hurting not only local schools, but schools all over the state because that, those, those ed, ed fund dollars go to Montpelier and then they're redistributed to schools everywhere. And, and Burlington is better able to, to provide those dollars than many other places. So, so everyone suffers from it in that respect. Thank you for clarifying that. And then Tony, just to make sure I understand, um, this ballot item does describe how the dollars would be used in terms of street scrape, streetscape improvements, stormwater utility, but your position is that it has not been spelled out adequately prior to people voting on the money. Really, what I'm okay. saying is, and the reason I object to this project isn't the streetscape, the pretty pictures are nice. Everybody likes the, the walkway and the bicycle path and so forth that, that would, would do. No problem with that. The problem is you have not attacked the basic problem along the street, which is speeds at intersections that are not protected in any way. And the speed management probably means roundabouts, as an example in the Winiski study. So my objection uh, you know, I can think of all my, I, but I'd also look at the alternatives such as the gondola lift and, and light rail. I think it'd be better investments, quite frankly, than fixing up Main Street. Um, but the, the point is that, that we, re, we are refusing in this city, we have 150 injuries a year, one a week as a pedestrian or bicyclist, two a car occupant. We've given no consideration to investing in the type of infrastructure, which is available and routine and now accepted uh, to stop injuring and killing people on our streets. It's the okay. dead bodies on the street. That's the issue. Wonderful. Thank you for clarifying. And I really appreciate both of you taking time to lay out your, your questions and concerns about this number four ballot question before the Burlington voters. That is to pledge the credit of the city to secure indebtedness for public improvements within the downtown dif TIF district, up to $32 million. I think that is the correct number. Um, somewhere in there between 25 and 30. And that um, that is going before the voters on March 1st. And thank you so much. Be sure to vote your ballot. City of Burlington people have come in the mail yesterday or today. So there's it's made as easy as possible. And thank you so much for watching. And I hope you stay tuned to continuing coverage of Town Meeting 2022 here at Town Meeting Television. Thanks for watching. Thanks.